Good afternoon. My name is Erin Sutton, and I'm a graduate student with the Levy Lab at the University of Pittsburgh. And today I'm going to talk about terahertz spectroscopy of graphene, lithium aluminate, strontium titanate nanostructures. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my co-workers at the University of Pittsburgh, our collaborators at the University of Wisconsin who grow our samples, and also the funding agencies that make this work possible. So let's begin. Many of us were in this session here today because of graphene, which is the reigning king of this class of 2D materials. And it is such because it continues to give us reasons to study it. Um, it allows us to study fundamental physical properties such as superconductivity, as well as, have it, as well as having many device applications across electronics and optics, which I will be discussing today. This paper to the left came out in, to the right came out uh, from Geim's group about 10 years ago and showed that uh, showed universal absorption in graphene from the UV to the near infrared um, defined by the fine structure constant to be 2.3 percent. Now for a single layer of atoms this is very impressive but for device applications in relevant wavelengths this really isn't good enough. So many, develop, many methods have been developed um, for light trapping and field enhancement to increase this absorption value in this wavelength range, such as plasmonic nanostructures defined on top of graphene, core shell resonators with graphene wrapped around them, or critical coupling to photonic crystals and nano cavities with metal back reflectors to increase reflection of the light. Today I'm going to talk about a new method we have to enhance the absorption of graphene uh, in the visible near infrared using graphene, lanthanum aluminate, strontium titanate, um, or LAOSTO nanostructures. And we can absorb, uh, increase the graphene absorption without covering the graphene at all or creating uh, complicated metallic devices. So let's talk a bit about the material structure which we use, the LAOSTO heterostructure. The interface between these two um, insulating complex oxides is rich with interesting physics, but what's most important to note here is the thickness-dependent metal insulator transition that occurs. When we have fewer than three unit cells of LAO on top of STO, the interface is insulating, but when we have greater than three unit cells, the interface becomes conducting, and a 2D electron system forms. When we remain at this critical thickness of three unit cells, you can reversibly switch the conductivity of the interface between insulating and conducting by, for example, applying a back gate to the bottom of the sample and changing the polarity of the voltage applied. In our group, we have developed a method to locally tune this metal insulator transition using conductive atomic force microscopy lithography, or CAFM lithography. So first, we grow thin films of LAO on top of STO at the critical thickness. We then fabricate contacts to this interface. We then bring a conductive AFM tip into contact with the top of the LAO. When we apply a positive voltage to this tip, we deposit protons on top of the surface. These, in turn, attract electrons to the interface, which locally modulate this metal insulator transition. When we apply a negative voltage to this tip, we effectively remove the protons that we deposited, erasing the nanostructures that we defined. Using this method, we're able to create structures as small as 2 nanometers, and it is reversible and reconfigurable. So that leads us to think of this system as analogous to an Etch-a-Sketch at the nanoscale. Of particular relevance to this work is the uh, nanojunction pattern, which is pictured here. So we have a four-terminal device in which we draw a nanowire from a source to a drain electrode. We create a 10 nanometer insulating gap in its center. And we also have connections to two voltage sensing leads. So we're going to generate terahertz radiation by applying a DC bias between source and drain, and measuring the photovoltage that's generated by ultrafast pulses hitting this nanojunction. Now, how exactly does the structure generate terahertz radiation? It seems like a strange claim, but it is due to the third-order nonlinear process in uh, the strontium titanate, which has the largest third-order nonlinear susceptibility in the solid state. So to visualize how this works, here's an equation for the third order nonlinear polarization. So we have a DC bias across the junction that's highly confined in space and constant in time, the third order nonlinearity, and then two optical fields that are highly confined in time. Um, and when we multiply these together, we get a nonlinear polarization that is highly confined in both space and in time as a function of the difference frequency of the optical fields. 
Uh, here is the schematic of our experimental setup. So we have ultra-fast pulses leaving a uh, TAS, TAS sapphire laser, and they enter a compact Michelson interferometer. The ultra-fast full pulse hits a 50-50 beam splitter, and the reflected pulse uh, hits an optical delay line that is composed of a piezo stage and a mirror. The two beams are recombined at the same beam splitter and focused onto the nano junction using a 100x objective. Then we measure the fold of voltage generated as a function of time delay. So using this method, we get time domain signals, as pictured here on the left. And when we take the Fourier transform of these signals, we look at the frequency components in the power spectrum. Using this method, we have demonstrated an over 100 terahertz bandwidth difference frequency generation. And I'm going to talk more about that today at noon, if you're interested. Uh, so we are motivated by the terahertz spectroscopy of nanoscale objects, since we have this nanometer scale resolution such as gold plasmonic nanorods, semiconducting quantum dots, individual graphene nanoribbons, and graphene itself, which I'm going to talk more about today. Pictured on the right is a schematic of the graphene hall bars that we define on top of the LEO-STO header structure. And then we have this nanojunction device drawn on, on top here. Due to the one nan less than one nanometer thickness of the graphene, Using CAFM lithography, we're able to write through the graphene to create um, this nanojunction device underneath the graphene at the interface. So zooming in here around the junction, we see that there is this 10 nanometer gap right underneath the graphene. When we apply a one volt DC bias across the junction, due to the 10 nanometer size of the, of the gap, we have uh, a very strong confinement of the electric and optical fields so that we have uh, about one megavolt per centimeter electric field at the junction, directly underneath the graphene. I'm gonna show data today of an experiment in which we tune the graphene Fermi level by uh, sweeping a DC gate with our four terminal connections as shown. So we're going to take terahertz measurements of the graphene as a function of the Fermi level or gate voltage. A typical time domain signal is pictured here. So this is when we have zero volts applied uh, to the graphene. In a typical time domain signal, we have a symmetry in the x-axis um, around time delay zero, and we have an asymmetry in the y-axis. And this asymmetry is due to the nonlinearity of the device. And we take the Fourier transform of this signal and look at the frequency components. We have the linear response here the difference frequency response, which is terahertz generation, and a second harmonic response. So we initially want to look at graphene to see its uh, terahertz response, terahertz plasmons, but what we ended up seeing really surprised us. So let's look at the gate-dependent measurements. We see that as we tune the gate, uh, starting at this negative DC bias on the graphene, we see something very strange that at first we thought was experimental error. We see a splitting of the time domain signal almost, like a hole appearing. And as we reach a certain gate value, this hole becomes very drastic, and then it goes away again. And when we take the power spectra of these time domain signals, we see where this hole appears in the time domain signal, there's a very sharp dip that looks like an absorption extinction at a particular frequency. So let's zoom into this. When we zoom in and look at this absorption dip in the visible linear infrared range, we see a more than four more orders of magnitude extinction of a particular frequency. And, and we attribute this to absorption. When we integrate the power spectra um, as a function of this gate voltage, we see the nonlinear response of the device is maximal around where this dip occurs. This is the difference frequency part and the second harmonic part. So there is some connection between the appearance of this visible near-infrared absorption and these nonlinear responses. So a picture to the left is the gate-dependent data that I showed before. Um, and you see that this dip appears and goes away again, so it's highly dependent on the graphing gate. But for a constant graphing gate in a different device, um, when we tune the bias across the nanojunction, we see that we're able to finely tune the extinction ratio um, at the absorption frequency that we see. So we're able to have this finer control. And here is a zoomed in image of a certain bias where we again see this four orders of magnitude extinction. So to go back to what we saw before, um, we're seeing an up to four orders of magnitude extinction at a very particular frequency. And this absorption is tunable uh, via the bias across the junction. 
We've observed this phenomenon in many devices at temperatures ranging from 5 to 80 Kelvin. So this absorption is a huge improvement um, over the 2.3% absorption in pristine undoped graphene. And we achieve it without having to fabricate any complicated devices or um, cover the graphene at all. So to conclude, the LAOSTO interface provides, provides a narrowband, continuously tunable, nanometer scale terahertz spectroscopy with an ultra broad bandwidth. Uh, gate-dependent absorption is achieved in the visible to near infrared using uh, this gate-dependent measurement of the graphene device. And we are still working to explicitly identify this absorption enhancement mechanism, whether it's due to the strong local electric field at the junction, uh, maybe a graphene quantum dot structure that is forming, or the plasmonic response of the graphene itself. And with that, I'd like to take any questions.